And depending on where you're joining from today, thank you for joining today's Digital Transformation live stream. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world with their digital transformation journeys. And this is a weekly live cast that we host every week at the same time to discuss all things related to digital transformation, the people, process, technology, and strategy sides of change. Uh, before I introduce my guest today, um, I'll tell you what we're going to talk about today. Today, we are going to talk about lessons from digital transformation failures. We're going to talk about some of the common patterns that we see and the co common lessons that we've learned from being involved with troubled or failed digital transformation failures. And uh, the good news, bad news situation is uh, there's a lot of a lot of examples to draw from in the market. So that's uh, that, that'll make for a good discussion today, but it's unfortunate that there are that many failures in the marketplace. So we're, we're going to talk about why transformations fail, what some of those common pitfalls are, what some of the lessons are, and what you can do differently to ensure that your digital transformation doesn't fail. Before I introduce our guest, um, I wanted to ask a couple things. One is this is meant to be a very interactive live discussion. So if you have any questions or comments along the way, I encourage you to please ask those questions and, and chime in uh, at any point. We'll make sure to um, get to your questions as we get get to the conversation here. And in the meantime, though, before we get to your questions, uh, because we haven't started the conversation yet, um, if you could just drop in the chat wherever you're joining from today, whether it's LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, if you could just drop in the chat where you're joining from today, what city and country are you in? That'll help us uh, get a handle here today. And we certainly have a global uh, a global panel here today, just the two of us, uh, Wayne and I are in completely di different time zones today. Um, but before we get to that, um, I wanted to introduce Wayne Holtham, who is Executive Vice President of Third Stage Consulting in Asia Pacific, uh, someone who's been in the space for decades now doing digital transformations and ERP projects. Um, so Wayne, welcome to the show. Thanks, Eric. Great to be here. Really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks for being here in the middle of the night, your time. Uh, you're based out of uh, Brisbane, Australia. So thank you for, for joining us at uh, a time that's convenient to a lot of us in the Americas and Europe, but not so much for you in uh, Australia. So thank you for, for accommodating the, the time zone difference here. Um, so before we jump into the discussion today, the whole thread of digital transformation failures, why they happen, what, what we can learn from them, maybe just tell us a little bit about your background and how you grew up in this, this digital transformation space. Uh, I've been around, as you can tell, for uh, a number of years, 20 odd years sort of thing, and, and worked on the sides where, you know, I've actually uh, been deployed uh, or deploying ERP myself, sort of a, as a company founder or um, with organisations that um, have deployed um, ERPs. And so I see it from the functional side as well as the delivery side. And so um, having been a consultant, um, uh, you know, probably... Um, for a portion of the time where I've been involved in change and been involved in um, some of the architecture, uh, those sort of areas, you start to get a fairly wide view of, of, of a program because they are quite complex. And so um, so for me, it's I've, I've, I've sort of been around the area where we've looked at each facet of what it takes and deployed that either as a consultant or as a functional manager um, uh, delivering that. So. Um, yeah, it, it does give you a bit of a insight into what can go wrong. Um, and many times things are hard to control. So uh, it's uh, yeah. it's been a, uh, an interesting career. This uh, digital transformation never, never amazes me um, uh, because there's always something new coming and uh, something new that's going to trip you up. So they are quite complex. Yeah, and technology is changing so quickly and the opportunity for improvement is so vast that a lot of organizations sort of get lost in that, that journey or you know, that whole process of closing that gap between where they are today and what technology could enable for them in the future. And maybe just to sort of transition into the first question or a first question I have for you is what are some of those common reasons why uh, implementations fail? And then I want to come back to maybe some examples that, that you've seen in your your um, in your career without mentioning organizations. This real requirements, does it actually meet what we need? And often it's difficult for an organization to be able to unpack what they really need and be very clear on what that is so that they can guide the vendor uh, or the system integrator to actually, um, you know, really scope out what sort of project it should be, the magnitude, the complexity, all of those sorts of things. And so at the beginning, it's very hard for them to really nail down this is what we need as a as a change to our business, as an improvement to our business, because that's, that's why we do 
uh, that's why we put new technology in is the aim is to be able to improve what we do. Um, and, and that's often very difficult. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, it's such a fundamental thing, but it, but also something that organizations so commonly forget about, or just don't think about, which is to have a really clear understanding of what it is they want. And it, and it seems like a lot of organizations think, well, we know what we want. We want to replace our old technology. We want to put in an upgrade of, of something new. We want to modernize our systems. Um, but that's usually not nearly enough to give clarity and direction as to how you're going to deploy technology, what technology you're going to deploy, what the impact of your organization is going to be, how you're going to improve your organization, all that stuff. That's, is that the sort of clarity of vision you're talking about? Or, or when you talk about having a clear understanding of what it is you want, what, what are some of those different dimensions? No, you're right. And I, th I think this, the, the dimension is knowing what you want and then how you're going to get there. And, uh, and, and some people believe that just by putting technology in, that paves the pathway to get there, whereas it, it probably doesn't. What it actually does is open up um, a lot of challenges to the business because, you know, people are going to have to do things in a different way. Um, you know, there, there's when you talk about processes that are involved in the business, people need to be able to think about that because often if we're putting new technology in, our, our context has changed, the way we operate has changed. And so all of a sudden the way we're going to use this, the solution is going to change. And if we haven't thought those things through um, and, and, and really considered what it means for us as a business, then just putting software in and the technology provider saying to us, yep, we've got the best software in the world. Look, it's uh, number one in the, in the, um, in the quadrant, it's it's all of those sorts of um, uh, promotional things that actually say we've got the best software, but it's only the best software on the basis of what the software vendor says, not not the best software for the fit for the business. And and sometimes trying to close that gap is the real challenge that uh, that organisations face when it comes to digital transformation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in a good uh, follow up follow-up question here is from Kyler, our, our podcast co-host, who's who's listening in in the background here, which is who should the key stakeholder be that champions this understanding of business goals and needs? Is there a certain person or persons within the organization should, that should be responsible for defining what that future state vision is for the organization? I think that the senior executive team needs to be the, um, uh, the, the, the drivers and understanding uh, of how the business they want it to operate in the future. And, and I think that's that's one of the challenges that happens is that you see that, you know, uh, and we, we've uh, had a call today where um, uh, someone was looking for an ERP and they, uh, they they send the junior out to go and explore what an ERP is. And there's no, no problems with that. But um, you talk about operating model and how's the business uh, looking to operate in the future and and a lot of those questions aren't understood um, whereas a senior executive is saying well you know we need growth we need to be able to improve our productivity we need to do those sorts of things and that starts to drive the discussion of what is the most suitable uh, ERP platform because uh, not a, not all ERPs can deliver some of those things and so um, so that's, that's one of the things I think that senior executive need to really understand if we're putting this in what do we want it to do for our business? How's that going to look? How are we going to get those improvements? Yeah, yeah. Now, once your executive team and your, your key stakeholders, your, your overall organization defines what those future state needs are, um, so let's just assume then for a moment you have clarity of vision. You have a clear understanding of what it is you want. You've got your future state our target operating model, um, organizational strategy. All that stuff is sort of laid out up front. You've done your, you've done your homework on that piece of it. What are some of the more tactical execution reasons why transformations fail? So once you get into the thick of it and you start going through the transformation, what are some of those other reasons why why you see failure points? Um, change is always always a common one where people underestimate the the, the amount of change that you need, and um, and often uh, you know when you look at a project and and um, people have sort of had a project running. Uh, they don't touch all of the people within the organisation or, or keep them updated about what's going to happen and then they deploy something. And so all of a sudden you've got to get a whole whole cohort, cohort of users to actually use a new system where they've had no experience and many of the processes become foreign. And so so that's that's another area that, um, that causes some challenges. The other one also is that, um, you know, we have technology, it's more far-reaching than what it has done in the past. And so 
Um, many times we're asking people who have never used the system before to actually be inputting information and, and that can take longer in what their everyday um, workload is. And so, uh, so you get a bit of pushback from that side. That uh, probably comes a bit to the change as well, but um, just that functionality piece that um, people are, uh, you know, struggle with to actually do something different. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to have a conversation about digital transformation in general, especially transformation failures without talking about change management, because that is such an important, uh, important reason or root cause for, for uh, resistance to change. Um, just to kind of come back to the audience here and, and where people are joining from, thank you for dropping in the chat where you're joining from today. Um, we have uh, people from all over the world here, ranging from uh, uh, Vancouver, Canada, uh, India, Grand Junction, Colorado, Montreal, Canada, Athens, Greece, UK, uh, Chennai, India, Athens, Greece again, uh, Nambia, Mumbai, India, Denver, Colorado. So uh, just a few examples of where, where people are joining from today. But thank you for, for being here, um, especially those of you like Wayne that are up in the middle of the night, uh, <laughs> their time. Um, but here's a question that, that I thought was a really good one uh, from YouTube, uh, from Khalid over on YouTube. He asked the question, how do you convey the importance of digital transformation to non-technical executives? And, and that it's it's interesting. It's a it's common um, problem that uh, organisations have is go well. We're looking to do digital transformation. I don't really understand what it means. I don't buy one every day. It's not something I implement every day. Some people, some executives may move from project to project, and and they may get engaged. And so there's a bit level of experience there. But um, it's I'll just share an experience where we had uh, recently we were working with a, a manufacturing organisation, and we actually presented to the board because. Um, you know, they're sort of saying well, we're going to we're going to reinvigorate uh, our ERP. So, uh, so we've had it going for a while. Uh, we don't believe it worked well at the time. We want to actually re-deploy um, a new version, and uh, and so we want to be able to um, to take advantage of the of the benefits that we're being told we have. And one of the questions the CEO uh, reached out and he said, "Well, can you give me in a very short uh, synopsis about?" what does ERP do? And so we went along and actually just did it in a, in a few sentences, what it basically does for his business. He said, that's the first time I've actually uh, been told that, and now it makes sense to me why you need to do what you need to do. And, you know, and uh, and it was it was quite interesting because often we have this assumption that the, that the executive should know. Uh, and I think we need to go back to basics and help them understand the basics. And I think um, they've Another client mentioned the uh, um, clip that you'd done, Eric, where you're taking your boys through, uh, I think it's Walmart or something like that, and you, you were describing how ERP works. And they said it's 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 really, really interesting because they didn't understand the depth and magnitude of what ERP does and how, how it should actually work. So um, so I think that understanding is a key one. And we, you know, we don't pay enough attention to it. We assume that people know, and that's um, it's always um, you know, always a risk if that's the case. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very very true. And you know, and in you know, bringing technology back down to earth, back to the strategic business centric focus level is really important to the uh, the non technology types. I, I think the where where organizations get into trouble with managing their stakeholders is when they get so focused on the need for technology. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, you know, one of the common themes we see now is that throughout the world, a lot of organizations are going through digital transformations because their software vendor is sunsetting their old legacy on-premise system, and they're basically forcing them to upgrade to a new system. And so a lot of times that becomes a, an oversimplified reason and purpose and direction for why we're going through a transformation because we have to, because our vendor is forcing us. Mm -hmm. And that may be true on the surface, but you really have to dig deeper and say, well, if we're going to go through an upgrade and we're going to spend all this time and money, we might as well have clear direction and uh, a clear vision and clarity on where we're headed, as well as the project governance, the change management, all the stuff that you know is, is going to be important on top of that. Um, that's, that's right. And, and, and one of the things that technology, as it's moved forward, it's become more complicated. It, I don't think it's got simpler. And it's, it's because it can do more. It's one of those things that before we were just putting in information and we would leverage that information, whereas today we want it to be able to do a lot more things. And so with that comes complexity. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, machine learning. You know, mm. our technology has machine learning. Okay. Well, what are we going to do with machine learning? <laughs> you know, how, how are we going <laughs> to? The software can do it, but what? 
how does that affect our business? How is it specifically to us? How are we going to leverage that? And what does it mean to us? And, and if we do use machine learning and we automate a bunch of people's jobs, what are we going to do with their jobs? You know, their jobs are doing today. How are we going to fill that time? You know, and just having that really clear understanding is, is important, but too often organizations just say, well, those people will do something more strategic. They'll have more time to be able to, you know, invest in thinking and doing more higher level strategic work. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Like to your organization? Because if I'm an employee, that's not what I want to hear. <laughs> I want to hear no, that's right. how, my, how my job is going to change. <laughs> that's right. And, and, and interesting is sometimes that, you know, people go, oh, we'll put in AI and we'll have that, um, the ability to be able to leverage that. And when you find that underneath AI is based on consistency of process and most organizations over years have, uh, you know, have evolved to the point where many people have different ways of doing things. And so, consistency is probably the furthest thing from them, from what they actually do. And so to come back to basics, you actually need to get consistency to make AI work, not just put in AI and expect it's going to work um, because that, that actually makes it worse. So um, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's one of those things that I think you need to really have a good look at where you are and, and how well you operate. Yeah. And also, you know, along those lines too, is if you look at where your organization is today, and where you're headed as far as potential technology, you have to understand like how, how much change do you really want to take on? You know, if you talk about artificial intelligence, for example, that's for a lot of organizations, that's a pretty big jump from where they are today. And that's okay if, you, if you're prepared for it and you've got the stomach and you've got the plan and you've got the patience and the resources to get there, then great. But the problem is so many organizations think it's going to be a quick lift and shift that's also going to just magically involve AI and other advanced technologies. And they end up cutting scope because they can't they can't consume that much change at once, and so they end up with a bunch of shelfware. So so you know it creates a lot of problems when you don't have a clear uh, understanding of that order of magnitude of change and understanding if that's realistic for you as an organization and your culture and your risk tolerance and all that all that good stuff. And, and that's right. And um, the global miner a few years ago um, decided that they were going go, going to go on the journey of a complete digital transformation across their whole global business. And uh, and and you know they had the view that it was going to take them uh, five to eight years to actually get to the point where they felt they would actually have the um, the digital platform fully embedded. And then they've spent the last three or four years doing continuous improvement to actually grow into that. And you think, well, so many people think oh, I've got to go live. I've got a, you know, I've got a system I'm going to implement, you know, maybe a year down the track, two years down the track, and that's it. Whereas, whereas you realise that, no, that's really the start. And so it, you, you've got to be in for that long haul because the, the magnitude of change is far greater than people uh, can imagine when they're embarking on one of these projects. Yeah, and that that magnitude of change is only increasing over time because technology is generally changing a lot faster than organizations are changing. So um, I think that's something to be mindful of. It is, it is. And and one of the things is that when you actually do um, work with a, you know, a platform over a number of years, you actually uh, uh, improve it to the point where you're very, very efficient with it and very effective with it. And many times it's been changed to the point where it actually suits your business. Then to go back to a new technology that might not be as mature, it might actually put you back um, to where you were probably five years prior. Um, and that, that's also a challenge for organisations, and, and some some are actually looking and, and struggling to have a business case to actually say putting in that new technology, even though you're forcing us because of sunset, um, you know, uh, software uh, coming to the end of its life and those sorts of things. Um, that they're also being challenged with that, saying, "Well, I can't get a business case out of this because your new solution isn't mature enough to actually deliver what we have today." So, uh, so that's also a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now we've been we've been touching on change management quite a bit here, and, and I wanted to get to this question from Shiva over on YouTube. Shiva asks, please highlight to what extent system integrator can involve in contributing to the organizational change management. So, in other words, what role does the system integrator have in change management? Should they have? Um, are they good at it? All, all that stuff. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah. Uh, often, often system integrators are poor at. Um, at change because because their focus is about building software it's about configuring software customizing software and so for their mind is that uh, change uh, the people part of that which is what change involves is probably their their uh, skill set that's that's least effective and so um, i think i think for uh, change management you need to actually have um, 
the, the the ability to be able to engage with the people, the ability to be able to help people understand the why that this change is happening, and uh, and and what it means to them, and take that fear factor out. And the system integrator is usually uh, not involved in that. You know, uh, they they are more focused, as we say, in being able to build and and craft the technology platform um, to deliver an outcome. And uh, the people outcome is not necessarily um, their strength. Right, right. It's a great, great point. And I, I agree with you on that. It's, it's usually not, they, they can oftentimes scratch the surface of training the trainers. You know, that's usually yes. something the focus, they might help with some real light communication type work. But when you start getting into the the heavy organizational design and change impact and um, user adoption and just getting deep into the change management, that's usually not what they do because it's not, it's not what they're core competency is and it's also not how they make most of their money they make most of their money on deploying technology um, yeah that's exactly right yeah how about um here's another interesting question another one from youtube uh, this is for myas uh, on youtube thanks for being here again today Ias, and i hope i'm pronouncing your name correctly um could you give us a stat about out of 10 implementation implementations or transformations the key stakeholders consider the whole project something more along the lines of I bought a new super cool toy for others to see. Um, so what percentage or how many out of 10 implementations would you say have that sort of, I don't want to call it the wrong purpose, but maybe the, the wrong focus of, of a transformation that's more focused on the technology and the cool stuff that the technology can do versus the more business focused approach to the to the transformation what are your thoughts there i would say we're probably seeing say seven out of ten and that's a really high number when you think about it that you know people people believe they're buying super cool and uh, really advanced when you know the basics of what the platform um is being put in for is being you know uh not really achieved and so uh, so that the trinkets and the bells and look how great this looks um and what it could do really relies on a lot more depth uh, of knowledge about the business to actually leverage that. And so often what you find is, you know, this, this really complex uh, solution that's put in, that they, they never really use all of that. And then, like you talk about so it's shelfware at the end of the day, because, you know, uh, a lot of it needs the, the basis and the grounding of the business to actually, and the process is quite clear to actually leverage some of that stuff. And so, um, so yeah, and, and, and software providers are, are very good at selling. They've got a great demonstration platform where, you know, and often when you see the demonstration, um, it's got the best data, it's got the quickest data, it's, it's been built purpose built. So it's a very mature, yet an organization when it starts off in a digital um, transformation, it's not mature. It's re reinvest, uh, reinventing itself in what it's doing, and so that that's where often people get caught up. Is they see the the end product and the destination that is probably, you know, the the best you're ever going to get and the most expensive. But you know, you're told it's out of the box, and you just turn it on, you know, and it's it's okay. Right. Yeah. And and if you look at the, you, you talk about how I, I know the question is more focused on the executives that that implement technology for technology's sake and due to the bells and whistles and the cool stuff that technology can do. But if you look at what the software vendors and the system integrators do, and just in terms of their choice of language and, and the words they use in describing their product, it's, it's, it's fairly misleading. I mean, if you hear, you hear terms like best practices or uh, pre-configured um, out of the box solution, uh, even the word digital transformation, the word transformation, it, it suggests that this is a transformative thing that's going to really improve your business. And to be clear, any any implementation is probably going to be a transformation, but transformation isn't always good. You could be, you could transform into something you don't want to become or something that's worse than what you have now. So the reason I bring all this up is you look at some of the sales messaging that software vendors, system integrators, and even the industry analysts that the software vendors hire to commission all these reports about how great technology is. Um, you, you have this whole, you're surrounded by all this over optimistic positivity. That's exactly what we want to hear as humans, but it, it sort of creates this unrealistic expectation of what, what it's going to take to make a transformation successful. Is that something you see as well? Yeah, very much, very much. And, and it's, it's interesting because the sales, the sales machine, uh, marketing machine has really probably the face of many of these organizations and so they 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 really trying to take the fear out of this change that's going to happen and like you say they they use wording they use um 
um, terminology that makes people think that, well, if I buy this, it's so well advanced that it's the risk is quite low. We should be able to just grow into this. It should be great. And, and the reality is that um, that's not the case. And, uh, you know, and if only we had, you know, um, the ability to be able to switch on, plug in people and download information into them and they would go off and do that sort of thing. I think it's called robotics. But at the end of the day, it's one of those things that, um, that, that that's that's the, the expectation they set up when it's not really the reality and, and the sales machine takes over and, and eases the mind of those people who don't really ask all of the questions um, but are provided many more answers than they probably ever imagined they would need to um, probably comprehend at the time sort of thing so so that that's that's the real the real risk is the marketing hype um, uh, overtakes what your needs are and so you think oh that'd be great think of all that you know and imagine the amount of data that people actually now need to extract you know, we want people to give us, you know, when they did this and at what time and how often and who they were and all of that sort of data. And you go, well, where does that add value in your business? And many go, oh, oh, um, never thought about that. And and so these are some of the things that you can have all of that, but does it actually add any value to your business just by knowing that a worker did something at a particular time on a particular day? And, a, you know, in some cases it might be as an audit trail, but um, but often it, it's not. It's one of those things that it's just the software vendor said, this would be great. This knowledge is so much power. And you go, well, does it add value? Probably not. Right. And the other thing too is even if it does add value, if you have technology that is uh, a big, massive jump for an organization, and if your organization isn't ready to make that jump and you're not going to be ready anytime soon, rather than just forcing it and saying, well, we're just going to force the organization to do something that we're not ready for, it's okay to take incremental steps toward mm -hmm. AI and super advanced technologies. You don't have to bite it all off now and within the next, you know, call it 18 months or 36 months or whatever your duration is. You don't need to implement everything in that time frame. You can do more incremental sort of a phase continuous improvement sort of thing where you're getting some core technology in place that's a lift from where you are today, but it's not taking you all the way to everything that technology can possibly do. Because if you do that, that's where a lot of organizations just get overwhelmed and they, they just can't handle that much change. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because some organizations will look at it on the view of that longer term with a the crawl, walk, run type um, approach where you start saying, well, we'll get it deployed and we'll get people using it and then we'll start to get better at it and, and then we'll actually start to leverage the technology to give us that advantage. But that takes continuous improvement, a lot of change and a, a, a good appetite for actually making that change and stick with it because uh, many times you'll find executives aren't around for eight, nine years sort of thing. You know, there's there's maybe a five-year, three, five-year cycle. And so a new executive comes in and wants to change things when you're already on that journey. And so it does make it harder to be able to um, um, probably put together a program where you're saying, well, this is a long-term, we're going to grow into it uh, and get the benefits that way. Uh, often that's a challenge for organisations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's some really good questions coming from the audience here and I'm, I'm having trouble prioritizing <laughs> to be asked because there are so many good ones. Um, here's one. This is from Kyler. And then I'm going to come back to another one that's somewhat related. This is from Kyler uh, on LinkedIn. She asked, how do organizations balance the need for innovation or competitive advantage with the risk of too much change that will disrupt the business? So I guess that whole phenomenon we're talking about now, that this whole thread we're on here with advanced technologies and being able to adapt to that level of change and that degree of change whether it's incremental or whether it's all at once, what, how do you balance that? Like, how do you, how do you balance that need to know that you to recognize that where we are today is not where we want to be in the future. So we know we need to change. We know we probably need technology to improve our business. So how do we do that in a way that drives innovation and it makes us better, but doesn't get so overwhelming that the whole thing falls apart? You know, how do you find that right balance? <laughs> I think often it's about understanding where you're starting from, you know, and, and many times we, we have change uh, people come in and, and uh, I don't like bagging change people because it's very, it's one of the areas I think is the least, um, um, the least focused on in, in these transformations, but you need to have a real good understanding of where you're starting and be honest with yourself. And so if you are immature in the processes that you have or the way you operate, be honest with that because if you think you're better than you are, then that causes your problem and, and people then 
um, have that view that they've got a shortened timeline to be able to get there. Whereas if you understand your starting point is where it is, and then you can start mapping out how it's going to take or how long it's going to take to actually get you to where you need to be. Um, you know, and I think that's that's one of the biggest challenges is that ability to be honest with yourself as an organisation because we all want to be in the eyes of, of uh, you know, our customers and our vendors that, we, you know, we're doing the best when often we're not. And uh, and and so it's, it's you know, it's, it's that thing of being really, really clear on how well we do things and then how far is that gap that we have to... Uh, to um, to navigate to actually get to the point where we've 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 actually doing what we want to do or or we can leverage that um, the benefits of transformation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How about this question from Khalid over on YouTube? He asked the question: Do you recommend having a digital transformation plan separate from the organization's strategic plan and goals, or should it be embedded? In, in my mind, it needs to be embedded. I, I think that, you know, it drives, and we, we often do this where we do operating principles where we start going, what, how do we want to operate that operating model? And, and that then drives the sort of technology, the pace that we want to do, what we actually want to bring into the solution. So sometimes the, the architecture you want to bring on board. Um, whereas if you, if you have that in isolation, you're just doing, you're just implementing technology. And often that's where it loses its way of, of, of where is technology a benefit to support the business as against it just being technology. And, and, and when they are separated, that's what you usually find is you get a technology platform that's been deployed and the business goes, well, that really didn't do anything for us because that's not the way we, we essentially operate sort of thing. So, um, so I think together is, is a big piece to that working right at the start, understanding you know, how you want to operate, what you want to do and how those processes, are, where's your value processes and such, what, why you're in business, what's the value you're actually deriving out of that. And uh, if you get that quite clear, then your technology starts to, to work in your favour. Right. Yeah, it makes total sense. And that's the best way to make sure that your digital transformation strategy and plan is aligned with your strategic goals and objectives. And it also has the other secondary benefit of making sure that your executive team, your key stakeholders are actively involved in defining what that digital strategy is. Otherwise, it becomes too easy for them to say, we've got our we've got our strategy up here, our organizational strategy. Now we just need you, Mr. or Mrs. CIO or IT director to go deploy new technology and we're just going to let you handle that. But there's not that connection, the connecting of the dots there and, and that ownership that you need to have at the executive level. So that's by embedding it, I think you get some other benefits as well that are really important. Yeah, and I've, I've seen projects where they sort of have this technology uh, agnostic view and, um, and, and say, well, we're going to do a uh, transform our business or improve our business and we're going to set all of those objectives uh, on one side and then we're going to go and look at how, you know, look at a technology solution and, and that there is a gap between those. And I think, like you say, it's an, it, when you actually view them together and actually work and Im embed them within each other, that's where the organization gets the, the overall benefits. Here's a tough question, but it's a good one. Uh, from Chris over on LinkedIn, uh, he asked, so if the marketing hype, empty words are seen as such, what is the better approach to connecting uh, words matter? And I, I totally agree. And I like this question because there is such a, the industry, the, the digital transformation space is so good at crafting very careful deliberate messages and words. And I've mentioned a couple of them like, um, um, industry best practices, mm -hmm. uh, lift and shift, even the word digital transformation. Another one is the art of the possible. You know, it's, it's these words that are very positive. Uh, they're very, uh, visionary. It makes you think this is great. You know, it's, 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 it, it feeds into the human psyche of what we want. We want to be better. We want our organizations to grow and to succeed and we want it to be easy we want this transformation to be easy so it's, it's sort of feeding into like our our own blind spots as humans um so how do you and then by the way one last thing on that note is you have this whole you have software vendors that are perpetuating this messaging systems integrators push that same message the industry analysts push the same message so as a person that's out looking to buy new technology you hear it from all these different sources and you start to think it's true you start to think these words are true and to Chris's point here that the, if they're empty words, they're seen as such, um, it's marketing hype, words matter. How do we connect the dots or how do we decipher between that hype, the marketing hype and the reality of 
what it is we need to do to just get down to business to to manage our transformation the way we need to. That's a, that's a great question, Chris. And, and uh, f- for my mind, it's one of those things where you actually, it, it's putting yourself in control about what is my business need? How does it operate? And when you go back to the vendor, it's about asking, can you demonstrate these sort of scenarios for me? So when I am purchasing, I actually put a lot of pressure on the vendors so that they actually aren't just doing the run of the mill or these so-called uh, streamlined processes they actually start to look at some of the context that I actually have in my organisation. And and it starts to show the warts and all of the system. If it's a good system, it should be able to accommodate that. If it's a system that's uh, that, that, that isn't as great and, and, you know, it has some high points, which is what they're showing in the demonstrations, then uh, it, it'll bring it undone. And, and that's a good point to bring it undone because you shouldn't really be buying that technology if that's the case. Um, and, and so often that first piece is knowing really what you want how your processes should work or how you ideally you'd like those to work um, and, and then asking the, the vendor to demonstrate that. And it takes away the marketing hype, knocks the wind out of their sails in the sense of, you know, this 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 balloon of of uh, wonderful stuff that's going to come out of this uh, this technology platform. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it makes total sense. And I think it really just gets back to you know, you can obviously you want to listen to software vendors, listen to industry analysts, you know, hear what they're saying, but you sort of have to take it all with a grain of salt and then get back to the fundamentals of what it is you're trying to do as a business. And you, you as a leader have to recognize, A, you're probably getting a lot of marketing hype. It's probably overly optimistic. You kind of have to see past that and really pick out the nuggets of value in what a software vendor or system integrator can provide. They're going to obviously try to sell you the sun, the earth, and the moon. They're going to try and sell you everything that they possibly can. That absolutely does not mean that it's that's what's best for your business. It means that is what they're trying to sell you. So I think you as a leader have to decide, just like anything we do as consumers, you know, there's a lot of things we could all be buying as consumers, but we don't buy everything that's out there. So we're selective. We prioritize. And I think as organizations, you have to be that way too and really look at, you know, what is it that's going to be best for our, our business. Yeah, and, and I suppose it's the basic sort of thing. It's if you look at it, we, we go into a, um, a a car a car sales yard, and they'll they'll sell us whatever they want to sell us, sort of thing. But if we stick back to the purpose of what we're actually buying, we'll we'll buy something that actually suits what we need it to do. And the same goes for software. We need to be back to focus. What do we want this for? How's it going to actually benefit us? Is it going to improve what we do? And, and get back to that that basics as against well, I bought a Ferrari to. Um, to move all the boxes in my warehouse, it's not going to work, is it? You know, and I think the salesman could sell you that, and you could get caught up in the, in the, um, you know, the the wonderful nature of driving around in this fancy fancy car or fancy truck or whatever. But uh, really, you need to get back to what's my need, what's my purpose, why am I why am I buying this? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what about when we when we shift gears a little bit and go? down back to the sort of the tactical execution level of a transformation. There's uh, you, you mentioned early, I think the first question I asked you, you one of your responses was that uh, organizations need to have a clear vision of, of what it is they want their future state to be. And having that clear vision is a, is a way to mitigate the risk of failure. But once you get into the execution and the actual implementation itself, what are some of the decisions that organizations make that commonly lead them to failure? So in other words, there's a it's usually not just one major thing that causes a, a transformation to fail. It's usually, it's almost like death by a thousand paper cuts. You just make a bunch of bad decisions, a bunch of bad execution moves. What are some of those decisions that are poor decisions that organizations often make that we we haven't already touched on? Uh, uh, it's, there's a couple that spring to mind. And, and uh, one of them is um, where they try to build in more complexity because a, a solution integrator gets value out of trying to make the system as complex as they can because they'll be around for a long time if that's the case, because if they, they've customised, they've built some code, they've done those sorts of things, then all of a sudden you're going to be their partner for a very, very long time. Um, so, that, so that complexity that doesn't need to be there, um, it's, it's, you know, if, you, if you actually adapt your business to suit the, the basic functionality of the software, you'd probably end up with a better outcome. Um, and, and the other one is ownership. You know, it's, it's that thing of uh, we've bought this, now it's going to be ours. We need to actually own it determine what we want it to do and be very clear as you work through that and often what what happens is it gets it evolves and grows and and then you the organization gets told well oh we sort of can't do this as well as what it what we thought it could do and and so 
if you let the if you let the vendor or the SI continue on that way, you end up where you've got a product which you really don't want to own at the end, and that's where that failure bit starts happening um, because you're not as close as you should be to what does that decision mean by them saying this? What does that mean for the overall project and understanding those sorts of things? And that's that's often a challenge uh, because no one's skilled um, from the, usually from the executive level. There's, there's the level of skill of ERP and, and deployments of uh, digital transformations is lighter than, say, a SI who's done many of them or a software vendor who's done many of them. And so, um, so that, that's a challenge for people is that they, they, the distance grows the further they go into the transformation. Right. Yeah, makes total sense. Um, how do software vendors and system integrators, I, in, before I ask the question, a lot of what we've talked about is internally focused the organization that's going through the transformation what are the mistakes they make you know they they don't have a clear vision of where they're headed they um, some poor decision making along the way they don't invest in change management they take on more than they can uh, realistically consume in their transformation so it's all been sort of internally focused but if we shift gears and look outside the organization and look to the software vendors and system integrators what are some of the things that they do to contribute to transformation failure that we should be aware of and just watch for during our own transformations? Um, it's interesting. They, they sort of lead you to believe that they've got an implementation uh, methodology uh, that actually covers you know, everything that you need. And, and what you often find is that it's a shortcut version to get the software deployed. And so understanding your needs. So they'll do a discovery. And, and usually what they're looking for is just those key areas that actually suit the, the software, not actually what the business is actually, what's happening in the business and, and the as-is type uh, situation. And, and so many times you start to find that the software vendor leads you to believe they're doing a lot more work in understanding your business and your organisation when really they're just trying to understand how they can get through this deployment um, um, as quick as they can. Um, and, you know, and hopefully you're actually doing that other other work and but they don't sort of tell you that you need to do that other work um even processes you know they'll sort of have uh, what they call world's best processes but they have them at the high level so they might be a level three or level four process but real detail is actually in your level five and level six processes because that's what people do every day and that's where all of the complexity creeps in and so if i've only ever built it to a very high level how do i get on when i actually have when i need it to actually deliver um, those everyday things that I'm, I'm looking for uh, as improvements. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those are great points. And uh, yeah, just just uh, recognizing that system integrators and software vendors could deliver, theoretically, they can deliver a technology that works uh, relatively easily. I don't want to say it's easy, but it's it's easier than changing an entire organization. It's easier to deliver technology that quote unquote works technical bugs work, it's integrated, the configuration set up right, workflows are working, all that stuff. But that doesn't mean it works for your business. And that's the that's the rub. I mean, the product that they were commissioned or hired to deliver may be working, but you as an organization are responsible for delivering change to your organization and improvement to your organization. And those, and those are two two very different things. So um, that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, and the, the last one there is benefits. You know, it's many times we... We have a business case where we believe we're going to put in this software, we're going to end up with some benefits. And what we what we end up doing is putting in software, but not really measuring what those benefits are. And often we can't even see what those benefits are because you know there's varying levels of what we call a failure. So yeah, it may be total disruption of the business, but you know, I, I think the biggest um, failure of a uh, digital transformation is where it delivers no benefits. Um, and, and those benefits cost you year in, year out. Uh, every year that you've actually got that solution in there. And so, um, you know, but no one measures that and no one probably raises that as being a, a high um, area where transformation has failed. You know, we look at the the, the whole scale, uh, you know, uh, where the business is being disrupted. Um, but but the, the other part is where we, you know, we're really not getting any ben benefit or value back out of what we've just spent. Yeah, it's, that's always crazy to me that, you know, your organizations are are so careful in how they spend some money in, in capital investments and things of that nature. Like, a, you know, if you, if a company were to go acquire another company or go build a building, you know, or, or build some sort of big asset, you know, they're usually pretty good at mitigating risk and having really solid uh, risk mitigation and project management, all that stuff. 
But for some reason, when it comes to digital transformations, they, they sort of, they don't apply those same competencies and mindsets to digital transformation. I don't know why it is. I, I haven't quite figured that out yet. I don't know if you have, but I don't know if it's because they think, well, that's, that's IT that's different. But I guess, I don't, maybe, what are your thoughts? I mean, why do organizations think of IT projects differently than they think of like an acquisition or building some big capital project? It's, it's interesting you say, because we we're actually talking to a client today and, and uh, they're in the construction industry. And, um, and, and their thing was that they actually, you can see it, you can touch it, you can feel it, and you, you almost can conceptualize it. Whereas with technology, much, much harder to conceptualize it because there's so many different factors that go, to, go into it as such. Whereas if I'm building something, you know, I've, I've got a, a fairly clear process. I put the foundations in, I do this, I get to this stage, I get to that. Whereas with digital transformation, it's not until you go to the final stage of pushing the button to go live, I actually start to see something that's really meant to be what I hoped I bought. Um, whereas a project, I see it coming as I go. And so if I start to see things going off track, you know, like the the, the foundations aren't as strong. I can I can attend to them early on. Whereas in digital transformation, it's hard to to stop at those stages and really know where you should be and what you should be seeing at that time. And that's that takes experience and that takes people that really um, are on your side. And I think that's one of the things that often that organisations don't really do is they don't have enough of their own power and knowledge to actually combat what the um, what the software provider and solution integrator will actually be telling you. And uh, and so, so you get led along a path and then, oh, it's too late. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess I would say to executives that agree with what you said, which is other stuff that we invest in, we can see it, touch it, feel it, but IT, we can't. I guess I would challenge that and say, well, then make it something you can see and touch and feel. Define in better detail what it is that you're trying to do rather than just say, well, we can't touch it, see it, or feel it. So we're just not going to treat it the same as we treat a, a, you know, a big building or a big piece of equipment that we're, we're trying to install. Um, I would say, well, then you better do your best to define a, some clear vision and clear tangible understanding of what the organization is going to be. It may not be a physical product like a machine or a building or whatever, but you can still have a very solid blueprint for what, what the organization is going to look like, the operations, all that stuff. So I think you have to kind of call out your inner engineer and change management type personalities to be able to, to be able to uh, connect those dots there for sure. And it's, 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 it's interesting that many people have the view that when they are going in a, in a construction side of, um, of a project, they'll actually look and see these, these different entry exit stages. So I'm, I'm getting into this and go, whereas, often that's not applied in tech, digital transformation. And so it's about taking it back a step. Well, what should I be seeing at this stage? And have I completed all of the steps I said I would do at this point to lead me into the next point? Putting that rigor around it and that assurance piece that's in there, entry exit gates, uh, to actually monitor and assure your project becomes a very good way to be able for the organisation to stay ahead of the game or stay in control as against be told, well, we qu didn't quite get this one finished, but we'll start on this other piece of work because, you know, we've got people waiting here to get going. You know, that the clock ticking type thing ends up um, causing as many issues as anything because, you know, we want to keep people busy. We don't want to lose headcount on the project. And, you know, and that's all of the language that a solution integrator or a software vendor is looking to be able to maintain because they've got a timeline. Their timeline is we're getting from here to here and we're going to go live. And so... We, we can't we can't handle any interruptions that you might have or anything where we haven't quite finished. Let's let's get onto that later. Um, you, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be finishing something and then moving into the next piece and be very clear on what that looks like. And I think that would bring it closer to the scenario that you'd feel when you're actually building something that's more tangible. Yeah. Yeah. I want to pull in another audience question. Uh here and just to preface it, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, I think I'm pretty good at asking uh, well-timed and high impact types of questions and very direct questions, but this, someone that's even better, way better than I am at this is Sam Graham, who's uh, frequently on our, our live streams and podcasts. So I appreciate, always appreciate his engagement and questions because he, he always has great questions and they always come at the perfect time. So his question is, uh, does senior management need education and how do we convince them that, that they do? Um, he's just calling out the <laughs> elephant in the room here, which is we're, we're kind of calling on, we're calling out on and picking on 
executives. So I, I apologize to all the executives listening to this discussion, feeling like the bullseye is on them because in some ways it is, it is on you, but um, do, do executives need more uh, education? And if so, how do we, how do we educate executives on all this stuff we're talking about, all these failure points? I think I think they do, and I think they need to be honest with themselves that they have a strength. And at many times, if I'm a CEO of a company or I'm a um, you know part of the C-suite, I'm engaged in that company to do certain things. Digital transformation is probably not one of my specialities that I've been engaged to do. And, and so, going back to that step of saying, well, what do I need to know to make this successful, and then put in the mind of how do I learn that. Um, and I think that's that's that leadership piece. Is you, you sometimes you see visionary leaders and um, and 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 they have that view of I need to learn to learn things to get to where I need to go, sort of stuff. As against I know it, so I just need to uh, roll it out. And in technology, I don't think you can have that. That's not a luxury you can have, is because technology does change. There's there's so many pitfalls that happen within technology, and so it, it's very important that pe- that that. Uh, senior executives actually go back, well, I'm learning something here and that will help me get to where I need to be as against that fear of, well, people should think that I know this. And so I'll just, I'll just keep going on with the belief that I, I should know it. And, uh, and, and, and in reality, they don't. Um, like you say, technology changes so fast and so quickly. Um, they should know how their business operates. And by learning more about what that technology means, they'll actually be able to join the dots a bit better. But um, um, getting them to actually learn it, some do. You see some really, really great uh, leadership teams out there and they really are embracing what it takes to actually make the, the digital transformation. But you see others that really just get the junior out there to go look at a digital platform and we'll buy it based on price and that's a, that's a road to nowhere. Right. Right. So if you had to summarize then, uh, what if you had to summarize just the handful of things, if we just sort of list out the, the commonalities of what, what causes digital transformations to fail, especially if we look at a subset of, you know, if you and I were to put together every troubled and failed implementation that we have seen and been expert witnesses for or helped recover in our careers, what are it seems like they all share common patterns. You know, there's things that they're doing that's very similar. It's not, usually it's not totally unpredictable or unexpected that these projects failed because they're doing a lot of the same things or making a lot of the same mistakes. How would you summarize some of those lessons learned or things that failures are doing that are, and they're doing them differently than the projects that, that actually succeed? Um, I think a lot of it is, um, and it's interesting, there's probably like four or five different areas that you start to see that, there is, um, you see these common failures that happen. One is not knowing where we want to go or what the direction is that we actually want to be. Um, you know, buying technology for the sake of buying, uh, buying technology, you know, thinking it's going to be everything for what we need. And, and, and you know, we're supported by that view because that's what we're told when we are purchasing. Um, the, the appetite for change, whether it be for our senior executive or for our people within our organisation, that, that's another one. Um, you know, leveraging technology and the complexity that top technology can actually bring in. So you start to see where, um, you know, we want to have a, a really complex stack of uh, of different applications. And, and then we don't understand how they all fit together. And so, you know, it's like playing in the sandpit. If, if not everything plays well, you end up where, you know, you've, you've people throwing the, the toys out of the sandpit sort of thing. And and that's what usually happens if, if we've got this, um, this functional architecture that doesn't work together, it's not seamless, then all of a sudden we've got problems happening. So I think, I think those three or four um, things seem to be the common areas that, that lead to that, um, that failure. And, and probably the last one is the strategic alignment um, of the executive is saying, well, we all understand the pathway we're on. We don't have some people saying, well, my department's not going to do that or we're not going to do that process because, you know, in an organisation, processes have an end to end. They start somewhere and finish somewhere and uh, and they cross many divisions within that organisation. And so you, divisional type um, uh, risks are often one of the, um, the contributors to failure when we talk about digital transformation. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, and then maybe just to, to sort of wrap up the conversation and, and give some tangible next steps or tips to organizations that are listening into this conversation. 
that are about to start on a transformation or maybe they're in the middle of it or early in the, in the transformation, what are some of the biggest things that they can do to ensure that they don't fail and that they do succeed? I know I, I sort of asked you what the, the failures have in common, what are some of those common patterns, but how do we translate that now into here's what you should do as an organization to ensure that you avoid failure? I think when you're getting advice, get it from people that don't have a vested interest. Um, and, and we fall into the trap that, you know, we go and uh, ask a solution integrator um, and they may be, may be dressed up as a, um, as a, a top tier consulting firm. Um, but, but in the end, they actually do sell software and they do do those sort of things. So sometimes the answer you get is the, um, is, is the answer that they want to give you, not the one you actually need answered. Um, so it's that independent, I think, advice where where you're actually getting it focused on your business and what your business outcomes are, and then start getting that building that level of information and knowledge based on that. Not someone who's saying, "Well, you know, the, the end of the answer is technology." So any question between that time is technology, and and that is the wrong way to go. Yeah, you think about all the you think of all the projects you and I have been involved with where the right answer probably would have been don't deploy that one module or that one piece of technology because that's the least of your worries. That's just going to complicate things. But you would never hear that from a software vendor. I I can't remember a time where a software vendor said, oh yeah, don't use our software for that because it's terrible. It doesn't work (laughs) for that one part of your business. (laughs) They won't say that. They'll say, oh, we have a module. You should deploy the module of my software that does that. Um, And it's understandable why they do that because that's their job, right? Their job is to sell you software and to deploy more software. Uh, but that's not always the answer. And it's okay to say we're going to take on less software, um, but we're going to do it in the name of really investing heavily in the people side of change, the operational side, the strategic alignment, it's all the stuff you've talked about in this whole discussion. We're going to do that stuff really well. And maybe we won't do as much technology. Maybe we're not going to invest as much in technology. Um, they may not want you to do that, but that could be the right answer for your business. And oftentimes it is for, for a lot of organizations. Um, yeah, yeah, right. And and that going back to that view of the crawl, walk, run sort of thing, sometimes having less technology, but more really focused on how well I use that technology is a good uh, crawl stage. And then obviously, as I grow more into it, I can add more into my uh, solution to leverage my maturity as I grow into the technology. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a good way to go. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, this is something we could continue to talk about for hours, but in the interest of your uh, disrupted sleep patterns uh, and, the, and the time zone difference, I, I won't do that to you. Uh, but I really want to thank you for being here today and being part of the show. This is a really super helpful conversation and something that's top of mind for a lot of organizations that are that are going through transformations. Um, also want to thank the audience for the great questions. I really appreciate it. Um, this this uh this interview will become part of the Transformation Ground Control podcast episode that gets released a week from tomorrow, next Wednesday. Um, every Wednesday, we release new episodes. It streams it streams every Wednesday to uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and you can also find it on all the audio podcast platforms like uh, Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon, etc. So be sure to check uh, out that full podcast. We'll edit this and add some more content to it and make it into a full episode. But want to thank the audience for being part of this podcast production here uh, live. Um, Hope everyone has a great week. Thank you again, Wayne, and I appreciate your time. And we'll see everyone next time on our Tuesday live stream. Take care. Have a week. Thank you very much. Thank you.